the holy name delivers one who has offended lord hari but deliverance is impossible if one offends you your heart is always the resting place of lord govinda and lord govinda says the vaishnavas are in my heart Six. I desire to have the dust of your holy feet in every birth I may take. Please consider Narottam yours and be kind to him. Jai Shri Narottam Das Thakur ji. Jai. Narayanam Namaskritya. Narayanam Namaskritya. Naram Chayva Narottamam. Naram Chayva Narottamam. Devim Saraswati Vyasam. Devim Saraswati Vyasam. मनसो भगवद्भक्ति भगवत्तत्व विज्ञानम मुक्त संगस्य जायते भिदयते हृदय ग्रंथी क्षीयते संशय क्षीयते चास्य कर्मा दृष्वात्मनीश्वरे अतो वै कवयो नित्यम भक्ति परमया मुदा वासुदेव भगवती कुरवंती आत्म प्रसाद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे मुनयो साधु प्रष्टो हम भवदीर्लोक मंगल यत्ता कृष्ण संप्रश्नो ये नात्मा सुप्रसीदती सवाय पुंस परो धर्मो यथोक्तिरधोक्ष अहेतुकी प्रतिहता यत्मा सुप्रसीदती वासुदेव भगवती भक्ति योगा प्रयोजिता जनयति आशु वैराग्यम ज्ञानम च तदहेतुक धर्मास्वनुष्ठा पुंसा विश्वक्सेन कथा सुया न उत्पाद्य धीरति धर्म श्रम एव ही केवल धर्म सही आप वर्ग से नाथोपकते नाथ से धर्म एकांत कामलाभा स्मृता काम से नेन्द्रिया प्रीति लाभो जीवित यावता जीवस्य तत्व जिज्ञासा नाथो ये हकर्म भी वदंति तत्व विदस तत्व ज्ञान अद्वय ब्रह्मेति परमात्मे भगवान शब्द ते तश्रद्धान मुनयो ज्ञान वैराग्यम युक्त पश्य आत्मनी चात्मा भक्त श्रुता गृहीत अतः पुंबेजा श्रेष्ठा वर्णाश्रम विभागश स्वनुस्थित धर्म से संसिदिहरिषण तस्मा देखे ना मनसा भगवान्त पति 
ಶೋತವ್ಯ ಕೀರ್ತಿ ತವ್ಯಶ್ಚ ವಾಸುದೇವ ಕಥಾ ರುಚಿ ಶ್ಯಾನ್ ಮಹತ್ ಸೇವೆಯ ವಿಪ್ರ ಪುಣ್ಯತೀರ್ಥ ನಿಷೇವನಾಥ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ Okay, that was just the second chapter. We are on uh, Bhagavatam. Uh, should I say, sing Jai Radha Madhava Hari now? Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janna Vallabh Giri Vardhari Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janna Vallabh Giri Vardhari Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari ಜಯ ರಾಧ ಮಾಧವ ಕುಂಜ ಬಿಹಾರಿ ಗೋಪಿ ಜನ ವಲ್ಲಭ ಗಿರಿ ವರದಾರಿ ಮಾಧವ ಕುಂಜ ಬಿಹಾರಿ ಗೋಪಿ ಜನ ವಲ್ಲಭ ಗಿರಿ ವರದಾರಿ ಜಯ ರಾಧ ಮಾಧವ ಕುಂಜ ಬಿಹಾರಿ ಗೋಪಿ ಜನ ವಲ್ಲಭ ಗಿರಿ ವರದಾರಿ ಯಶೋದನಂದನ ಬ್ರಜ ಜನ ರಂಜನ ಯಶೋದನಂದನ ಬ್ರಜ ಜನ ರಂಜನ ಯಮುನ ತೀರಾವನ ಚಾರಿ ಜಯ ರಾಧ ಮಾಧವ ಕುಂಜ ಬಿಹಾರಿ ಪಗಿರಿ ವರದಾರಿ ಜಯ ರಾಧ ಮಾಧವ ಕುಂಜ ಬಿಹಾರಿ ಜನ ಮಲ್ಲಭ ಗಿರಿ ವರದಾರಿ ಜಯ ರಾಧ ಮಾಧವ ಕುಂಜ ಬಿಹಾರಿ ಜೊತೆ ಜನ ಮಲ್ಲಭ ಗಿರಿ ವರದಾರಿ ಹರೇ 
Six verses to do today, so we'll take our time. We'll read per person verses. Shonaka Vacha Ashwatthama no Pashtena Brahma Shishno Rutejasa Uttaraya Hato Garba Ishena Jivita Puna. Ashwatthamano Parshnena Ashwatthamano Parshnena Brahma Sirshno Rutejasa Brahma Sirshno Rutejasa Uttaraya Hato Garbha Ishena Jeevita Puna Ishena Jeevita Puna The sage Sonaka said The womb of Uttara The womb of Uttara Maharaj of Mother of Maharaj Parikshit was spoiled by the dreadful and invincible Brahmastra weapon released by Ishvatthama. But Maharaj Parikshit was saved by the Supreme Lord at 1.12.1. The sages assembled in the forest of Nemeshara and I inquired from Sutta Goswami about the birth of Maharaj Parikshit. But in the course of the narration, other topics like the release of Brahmastra by the son of Drona, his punishment by Arjuna, in Kunti Devi's prayer, the Pandava's visit to the place where Bhishma Dev was lying, his prayers, and thereafter, the Lord's departure for Dwarka were discussed. His arrival at Dwarka and residing with the 16,000 queens, etc., were narrated. The sages were absorbed in hearing such descriptions. But now they wanted to turn to the original topic, and thus the inquiry was made by Shonaka Rishi. So the subject of the release of Brahmastra weapon by Ashwatthama is renewed. So in my comments about this verse is just about Ashwatthama, you know. Uh, so Hari, tell me one fact about the life of Ashwatthama. He not only just killed the babies, he killed all the warriors which were left in the camp of Pandavas at the end of the war in a very cowardly and niggardly way very cowardly way and uh, then he went to tell Duryodhana all of that and Duryodhana could die peacefully but again you know it was a very heinous act by Kripacharya and Ashwatthama so that's one thing he did at the end of Mahabharat war at that point he was the commander in chief and then he left, left the Brahmastra which was eventually then spoiled by Krishna Pandavas bind him up and bring him in front of Draupadi and Draupadi spares his life let him go other uh, facts about Ashwatthama Okay, now we can, uh, sorry, Hari. Sorry, the fan is too much, you know, with the cold, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, other facts about Ashwatthama's life. 
I like if somebody asks you who was Ashwat Thama, what would you say? Son of Dona Chaya. Donacharya prayed to Lord Shiva for a son who's as powerful as him. And Lord Shiva gave his own partial expansion as Ashwatthama. So Ashwatthama is a partial expansion of Lord Shiva, not an ordinary personality. Was born with a with a gem on his forehead, which basically ensured that he would never suffer from hunger, thirst, or fatigue. Hmm? So very, very powerful personality. Rudra, he's considered one of the Rudras, partial expansion of Lord Shiva, just like Durvasa Muni is. Durvasa Muni is also a partial expansion of Lord Shiva. Um, and he was born with a jewel on his head, which relieved him from hunger, thirst, and fatigue. What else? After this event, after the event, Durvasa Muni was actually, he actually Yeah, absolutely. Fury, yeah. Ruby, yeah, exactly. Beautiful Hari. Uh, the other facts about Ashwatthama. Anybody? Other things about Ashwatthama? So once uh, when they captured Ashwatthama after the uh, three different of property, everybody was wanting to get rid of the children. Even Krishna. But then property saved him. And then they said, no, we still have to punish. So how he got punished by research for Brahmana to do save that and Mustache, yeah. So that's where he was eventually. Yeah. End of Kali Yuga? End of this Yuga or end of the universe? Another interesting facet about Ashwatthama, they were not able to kill Drona in the war. So Krishna said to tell uh, Drona that make a declaration, you know, that Ashwatthama is dead. You know, and, and Ashwatthama, the, so Yudhishthira Maharaj very nicely said, Hail, you know, come on, come on, everybody listen, Ashwatthama, elephant is dead. <laughs> and Drona, Drona put, his medit put his weapons down and he sat on meditation for the soul of his son. To deliver the soul of his son, he sat on meditation. And at that time, Dhishtadhyumna chopped his head off. So that was uh, another incident which comes to become a great warrior, fought valiantly, but then he's always remembered for his cowardly act. Okay. So just a few, uh, any other uh, facets about Ashwatthama or any other facts about Ashwatthama? Can I keep on through? Nice. Okay. So we discussed that. Um, text two. Tasya Janma Mahabuddhi Karmani Cha Mahatmanaha Nidhanam Cha Yathai Vasit Sapretya Gatavan Yatha 
तस्य जन्म महाबुद्धि कर्माणि च महात्मना निधन च यथासेत स प्रेत्यगतवान यथा ट्रांसलेशन हाउ वाज द ग्रेट एम्पर परीक्षित हु वाज अ हाईली इंटेलिजेंट एंड ग्रेट डिवोटी बोर्न इन दैट वोम हाउ डिड हिज डेथ टेक प्लेस एंड व्हाट डिड ही अचीव आफ्टर हिज डेथ परपुर The king of Hastinapur used to be the emperor of the word, at least till the time of the son of Maharaj Parikshit. Now this word means Jambu Dwipa. This word means Jambu Dwipa. Parikshit did not rule this earth. Parikshit ruled Jambu Dwipa. But his kingdom was Hastinapur did not end. Yeah. Maharaj Parikshit was saved by the Lord in the womb of his mother, so he could certainly be saved from an untimely death due to the will, ill will of the son of a Brahmana. Because the age of Kali began to act just after the assumption of power by Maharaj Parikshit, the first sign of misgivings was exhibited in the cursing of such a greatly intelligent and devoted king as Maharaj Parikshit. The king is the protector of the helpless citizens, and their welfare, peace, and prosperity depend upon him. See, this is a very interesting idea of Vedic culture that the welfare, peace, and prosperity depends upon the leader, and if the leader is fallen. if the leader is fallen that brings misfortune to the constituents we hear from this past time of uh, brihaspati and indra brihaspati is walking in the assembly of the demigods and indra doesn't get up puffed up and that brings misfortune to everybody all of the devatas and on the other hand we hear the hear about you know the beautiful uh, conduct of ramti deva you know in the ninth canto and we find that because of the leader's conduct because of his wonderful conduct everybody is blessed with peace and prosperity now every one of us is a leader huh? and conduct matters and the conduct of the leader matters when the leader is pure then it brings peace and prosperity and health and wealth and and spiritual development to his constituents if a guru is pure his disciples benefit and same there are so many levels of leadership you know you have gbc members you have presidents you have supervisors you, know. you have individual devotees families father is the leader of the family like that you know so it's very important to understand that leadership is a huge huge burden huge responsibility huge responsibility when leaders behave nicely if they're pure in their conduct then it brings um, then it automatically brings um, um prosperity and welfare and peace to everybody um unfortunately by the instigation of the fallen age of kali an unfortunate brahmana son was employed to condemn the innocent maharaj parikshit and so the king had to prepare himself for death within 7 days that's another point you know you know uh, thou shall not bear false witness one should not be easy quick to condemn and to judge others one should not be quick to met punishment to others one should never assume wrong doing it's actually the natural case because false ego feels good the tendency for find faults tendency to ascribe blame somehow it just feels good in the you know i'm having a very boring life let me create a scandal you know i am miserable as it is let me just feel little good about myself by putting somehow or another others down whatever it is and that manifests as prajalpa that manifests as blaming fault finding talking about somebody's somebody's mistakes you know one should be very careful about these things these things actually bring most misfortune they literally bring misfortune they bring poor health they bring poverty they i mean what to talk about chanting the taste for the holy name taste to see the deities the the whole transcendental realm krishna says okay let me just cover myself up with the curtain you go ahead with your with your condemnation
My, my realization is that one should give a slack to devotees, one should give a long rope to others, and one should be harsh with oneself. One should find faults with oneself, with one's own behavior. So we have already heard, you know, we should just focus on the good in the others, not anything else. That's the topmost devotee. Just focus on the good. Whatever you will focus on, whatever you will meditate on, that will grow. That will be nourished. That will be enhanced. So I think one of the very important principles of life is to accept reality as it is to accept devotees and people around us as they are. And one can only teach by example. And that means one has to elevate oneself. And when one elevates oneself, you know, Prabhupada talks about being an Acharya. Acharya literally means one who teaches by Achar. Sanskrit is an important language. Achar means Acharya. Acharya means one who has amazing conduct. And by his conduct, Krishna will bring people to him who will want to emulate him and follow him and elevate themselves. But to unnecessarily disturb one's mind and to disturb the minds of others and to disturb the minds of other people by unnecessarily fault-finding and correcting them, it's not good. It's not spiritual. Sometimes we have to maybe very humbly and nicely and politely request for certain things. You know. Okay, you can you know request certain things, make a certain you know you have to also kind of do things properly. So here, the king is the protector of the helpless, and that's the meaning of Kshatriya. The reason why Kshatriya, the, the predefining characteristic of a Kshatriya, is his ability to protect others, is his ability to protect the weak. That's an overwhelming ability of Kshatriya. Kshatriya means to protect Shat. Triya Trayate means to deliver. Shat means harm. The defining characteristic of Kshatriya is actually not administrative leadership or even you know, um, you know, other things like charity and valor and all of the other things, but actually to protect people, to think of their welfare. That is a defining characteristic of a Kshatriya. And a Kshatriya who gives up his life in that way, in the course of duty of protecting others, goes to heaven. Prabhupada, in the first words of Bhagavad Gita, in the purport, he writes, a Brahmana who gives up his life pursuing spiritual duty, and a Kshatriya who gives up his wife fighting for others, they both are eligible to enter into the sun globe. So when you actually fight for the protection of others, not for exploitation of others, and it can just start with one's own, own family members, you know, and then you expand your circle of influence to, to furthermore, furthermore, furthermore. So one should act in a way which, which protect others. Depend upon the welfare, peace, and prosperity depends upon the king. And unfortunately, this Brahmana's son was employed to condemn. See the snake? Shara, curse. I curse you. You know, we also sometimes become mentally very agitated about behavior of others. So thou shall not bear false witness. One should not condemn others or judge others or ascribe fault to others. You know, in, 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 we see in, in our society, people are very quick to condemn leaders very quick to condemn you know all positions of uh, or of authority this is a big 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 fallacy big fallacy or or just judge and correct others and condemn others and find fault with others behavior you know? one should glorify others you know, Krishna Krishnaprabhu is organizing this 50th anniversary of the oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, so the king had to prepare himself for death. Maharaj Parikshit is especially famous as the one who is protected by Vishnu. And when he was unduly cursed by a Brahmana's son, he could have invoked the mercy of the Lord, but he did not want because he was a pure devotee. He could have said, Krishna is on my side, you know, but he did not. 
A pure devotee never asks the Lord for any undue favor. Usually it is said that as a pure devotee, you can ask in situations of emergency or impending death. But Maharaj Pariksit did not want to ask for any undue favor. I'm cursed to die, I'll accept it, I'll die. Okay, fine. I'm not going to ask Krishna to protect me or change the situation. Okay, it's better. It's better to fast and, and just sit on the banks of Ganga and hear Bhagavatam and I'll die. That's better. I'm not going to ask for any undue favor. Hare Krishna. Hare Bo. Renunciation. Maharaj Parikshit knew that the curse of Brahmana's son was upon him was unjustified as everyone else knew. But he did not want to counteract it because he knew that the age of Kali had begun and the first symptom of the age, namely degradation of the highly talented Brahmana community had also begun. He did not want to interfere with the current of the time, but he prepared himself to meet death very cheerfully and very properly. Being fortunate, he got at least seven days to prepare himself to meet death. Here Prabhupada is saying he got seven days to meet death because he was fortunate. You know, death comes in all shape and size. And Hari was saying that uh, that this this life is so vulnerable, so fragile. We heard about Payonidhi Prabhu huh, recently. Beautiful, wonderful brahmachari. We heard about another disciple of Prabhupada passing away. We hear almost every week devotees passing away. And the miracle is we think it's not going to happen to him, us. And we make plans for happiness in this world. Death is the great leveler. You know, there's a book called Denial of Death, and I would strongly encourage you to read that. It's basically the premise of the book is anything and everything we do in this world is actually a denial of death. You know, one should keep death in the front and the center of the mind. I'm going to die, I'm going to pass away, this body is going to go away. Everything I work hard to acquire is all going to be finished. Everything. So let me just get enough so I can serve Krishna and use my time in the service of the Lord. And Akinchana Gocharam means that doesn't have, who doesn't have anything. Maharaj Pariksit was the king of the universe. But one who doesn't think that he has something. Everything belongs to the Lord. He's not the proprietor. And one should think in what situation, in what circumstance I can serve Krishna best. And one should just do that. Whatever situation I can serve Krishna best, I should just do that. Always remembering death. Bhakti Tirtha Swami used to say that one should chant, thinking that today is the last day of my life. That can really set your priorities right. You know, Today is the last day of my life. How would I behave? What would I do? At least spend the two hours of the day like that. Okay. Being fortunate, he got at least seven days to prepare for death, and so he properly utilized that time in the association of Sukhdev Goswami, the great saint and devotee of the Lord. Text three. Tadidam shrotam achamo. Tadidam shrotam achamo. Gaditum yadi manyase. Gaditum yadi manyase. Bruhi na shadda dhana naam. Yasya Gyanam Chaduk Yasya Gyanam Madachuka Tad Idam Shrotam Chamu Gaditum Yadi Manyase Bruhina Shadadhananam Yasya Gyanam Madachuka we all respectfully want to hear about him to whom Sukhdev Goswami imparted transcendental knowledge. Please speak on this matter. Now, this idea of that Sukhdev Goswami imparted transcendental knowledge, the way Parikshit Maharaj received transcendental knowledge was he, he gave submissive oral reception to Srimad Bhagavatam. There is this idea that the Guru is going to give some mercy or Guru is going to deliver the disciple or Guru is going to give some electric current or Guru is going to show some magic or the Guru is going to do this, or Guru is going to do that. Well, Guru will speak on Srimad Bhagavatam. It's the duty of the disciple to give submissive oral reception to, to Srimad Bhagavatam, to learn Bhagavatam, to preach Bhagavatam, to speak about Bhagavatam. 
to distribute bhagavatam to memorize bhagavatam to focus one's life on bhagavatam open a bhagavatam window on your computer and along with the youtube and facebook also read shrimad bhagavatam or maybe just close the youtube and facebook window and, and read bhagavatam anybody can read a chapter of bhagavatam every time you log on to a computer read a chapter of bhagavatam keep the bhagavatam window open keep the veda based bhagavatam window open and you can make a punishment okay if i spent so much time doing things which have no relation to krishna i will do one chapter of bhagavatam as a punishment so basically that is what so here prabhupad is explaining he spent time with a saintly person but what did he do in the in the association of a saintly person he stopped eating and drinking and sleeping and gave submissive reception and asked relevant relevant questions that's the essence of the relationship between guru and disciple let me ask relevant questions <laughs> relevant inquiries you know prabhupad would get very upset swami ji how are you doing so <laughs> this is not a question you ask your spiritual master how Raghavan Swami gets so upset. One time, me and Navin Krishna Prabhu were driving. He's sitting in the back. You know, Navin Krishna Prabhu wanted to talk, so he asked one question. So Maharaj answered. He asked second question, and Raghavan Swami said, "Navin Krishna Prabhu, I think you should keep your eyes on the road and keep driving." <laughs> <laughs> you know. You know, Prabhupada explains in the third Kapila Dev tells Devahuti that the sound vibration is very powerful. one should maintain silence or chant hari krishna maha mantra one should not speak unnecessarily don't use the sound you're doing some service do your service be in that in that consciousness beyond time and space be mindful be meditative in everything you do what is the reason to speak so much when if you're speaking then chant the hari krishna maha mantra i am the sound in ether i am the i am the om in the vedic mantras So use that sound to vibrate Om, and Hare Krishna is the same as Om. Hmm? Prabhupada explains in Gita that one's ability to speak should be utilized properly, and one should be mindful and meditative and internal and reflective and contemplative. Okay, purport. Subhadra so, Goswami imparted transcendental knowledge to Maharaj Parikshit due to the remaining seven days of his life, and Maharaj Parikshit heard him properly, just like an ardent student. The effect of such a bona fide hearing and chanting of Bhagavatam are equally shared by both the hearer and chanter. Both of them are benefited out of the nine different means of devotional service to the Lord prescribed in Bhagavatam. Listen to this: either all of them. or some of them or even one of them are equally beneficial if done properly hmm? properly discharged so kali yuga is that in kali yuga it is based on see through pro- proper discharge of other process of devotion service they have to be based on a foundation of hearing and chanting hmm. that's the general rule there are lots of exceptions even in kali yuga there are lots of exceptions lots of devotees who who have you know sacrificed their life in the mission of the lord they all benefit equally they attain full samadhi full samadhi even if their hearing and chanting is not clear now this is another beauty of krishna consciousness you know the beauty of krishna consciousness it's a sublime process meaning sub- sublimation means gas goes to get uh, solid becomes gas without going through the intervening process so the intervening processes are nishkam sakam karma nishkam karma ashtanga yoga gyana yoga dhyana yoga and bhakti yoga you know krishna is so merciful that if a devotee is sincere doesn't commit offenses he chants his japa even though he has impurities krishna can give him direct perception of himself These deities are not deities, you know. You come in the temple, suddenly they start talking to you. Suddenly they become alive. This is a fact. Fact. 
so that is the beauty of bhakti yoga bhakti yoga is a very powerful powerful process so prabhupad is writing here hari and that is definitely true in kali yoga but again that's that's the rule with lots of exceptions lots of exceptions somebody may have not done any chanting and get to serve a pure devotee in his sickness or help a devotee in, in state of emergency somebody may have no spiritual qualities but get to do some service for krishna huh? yes krishna is a transcendental independent autocrat of course we should not look for honorary degrees and we should not try to look for shortcuts but we should also be and open to this idea that krishna's mercy can manifest in any way on any jeeva huh? so that's an idea there um, maharaj parikshit and sukhdev goswami were serious performers of the first two important items namely the process of chanting and the process of hearing and therefore both of them were successful in the laudable attempt this attempt was laudable transcendental realization is attained by such hearing and chanting and not otherwise so serious chanting and serious hearing is the way of transcendental realization a lot of time devotees feel you know my guru maharaj ji what i don't know what he is doing in my life he has he has 100000 disciples does he even know me in today's day and age where technology is available you know pretty much every lecture is there all the instructions are there there is a type of spiritual master and disciple much advertised in the age of kali it is said that the master injects spiritual force into the disciple by electrical current and the disciple begins to feel the shock he becomes unconscious and the master weeps for him exhausting his store of so called spiritual asset such bogus advertisement is going on in this age and the poor common man is becoming the victim of such advertisement we do not find such folk tales in the dealings of sukhdev goswami and disciple maharaj parikshit the sage recited bhagavatam in devotion and the king heard him properly the king did not feel any shock of electrical current from the master nor did he become unconscious while receiving knowledge from him <laughs> one should not therefore become a victim of these unauthorized advertisements made by some bogus representative of vedic knowledge the sages of nemeshwar are never respectful in hearing about maharaj parikshit because of his receiving knowledge from shukdev goswami by means of ardent hearing ardent hearing from the bona fide master is the only way to receive transcendental knowledge and there is no need for medical performances or occult mysticism for miraculous effect the word mysticism comes from the english word misty misty means little hazy you know not very clear not very oh, it's very mystic there's nothing mystic as such all well, the mystic is the mercy of the lord he is the supreme yogeshwar he is the mystic krishna is the mystic jiva is not the mystic the process is simple but only the sincere party can achieve the desired result now this is an interesting idea that bhakti is simple but it requires some sincerity it is simple for the simple text for suta watch api pala dharma raja api pala dharma raja pitra vadran jayan praja pitra vadran jayan praja nishpriya sarva kamebhya nishpriya sarva kamebhya krishna padanu sevaya krishna padanu sevaya api pala dharma raja api pala dharma raja pitra vadran jayan praja निष्प्रिय सर्व कामेभ्य कृष्ण पादानुसेवया गोस्वामी सेड एम्पर युधिष्ठर एडमिनिस्टर जेनरसली टू एवरी वन ड्यूरिंग इज रेन ही वॉज एक्जैक्टली लाइक इज फादर ही हैड नो पर्सनल एम्बिशन एंड वॉज फ्रीड फ्रॉम ऑल सॉर्ट ऑफ सेंस ग्रेटिफिकेशन बिकॉज ऑफ हिस्स कंटिन्यूस सर्विस एंड टू द लोटस फीड ऑफ लॉर्ड श्री कृष्ण what a beautiful word so huh? nishpriya this word comes in many of the songs of acharya nishpriya without any personal ambition 
निष्प्रिह एंड निष्प्रिह सर्व कामेभ्य ऑल डिजायर फ्री फ्रॉम ऑल डिजायर फॉर फ्रोटिव एक्टिविटी फॉर सेंस ग्रेटिफिकेशन फॉर मेंटल स्पेकुलेशन फ्री फ्रॉम ऑल डिजायर कृष्णा पादानुसेव Shri Sutta Goswami said, "And Maharaj Emperor, uh, Emperor Yudhishthir administered generously to everyone. He was exactly like his father. He had no personal ambition, and he was freed from all sorts of sense gratification because of his service unto the lotus feet of Lord Shri Krishna." Purport, as mentioned in our introduction, there is a need for the science of Krishna in human society for all the suffering humanity of the world. So, this science of Krishna is pure devotional service. This is what Prabhupada is saying: the science of Krishna, pure devotional service, is a science in itself. it can fulfill all the needs of individual and collective society without any without anything else that's the science of krishna and we simply request the leading personalities of all nations to take up the science of krishna consciousness for their own good for the good of society and for the good of all the people in this world this is extremely convincing that actually without god without krishna consciousness nobody can help anybody the so called help to the body and mind mind is fickle the body is fickle senses are fickle what are you going to help how can you help something which changes every minute how can you help what is the help there it's a waste of time without having profound degree of spiritual realization one actually cannot help anybody that is a fact one can minister to the body and the mind and people appreciate that there is no doubt about that people do appreciate that but again it's in, it's basically without spirituality without krishna consciousness without connection with krishna it's all very temporary it's a fruit of activity it it it, it ensures good karma in some previous life that's all So Prabhupada calls it the science of Krishna. So it is confirmed herein by the example of Maharaj Yudhishthir, the personality of goodness. In India, the people hanker after Ram Rajya because the personality of Godhead was the ideal king, and all other kings or emperors in India controlled the destiny of the world for the prosperity of every living being who took birth on the earth. Here, in the word praja is significant. The etymological import of the word is that which is born on the earth. There are many species of life, from aquatics to perfect human beings, and all are known as praja. Lord Brahma, the creator of this particular universe, is known as Prajapati because he is the grandfather of all who have taken birth. Everybody comes from Brahma. He is the source. He is Prajapati. He is the one who is giving birth. Not not by evolution. Thus, Praja is used in a broader sense than it is used now. The king represents all living beings. aquatics plants trees reptile birds animals and man every one of them is a part and parcel of the supreme lord and the king being the representative of the supreme lord is duty bound to give proper protection to everyone this is not the case with presidents and dictators of this demoralized system of administration where lower animals are given no protection and the higher animals are given protection but this is a great science which can be learned only by one who knows the science of krishna Prabhupad explains in the third canto of Bhagavatam, one who worships the deity but he does not know how to relate to other human beings and doesn't see Paramatma in the heart of every living being. Religion does not mean performing rituals in churches and temples and mosques. I hate Muslims. Muslims hate Christians. Christians hate Hindu. Hindu hate everybody else. This whole nationalism and sectarianism is not Krishna consciousness. It's very aggravating, very agitating. It stems for the basic need for defense. defending just like we know that excessive eating and sleeping and mating is wrong excessive defending in the form of nationalism my religion my country my faith my people so what should one do i mean of course if one is attacked and one has a some area of influence one can act in self defense but that's not really the case sitting in america i am unnecessarily agitated by some political movements and political upheavals it's not going to do anything and a devotee has to really understand that every jeeva is is uh, is the home of parmatma and if you look at pure devotees haridas thakur jesus christ they never you know 
they never retaliate. Should we retaliate? I mean, Kshatriyas have a duty to protect and to, and you know, violence is necessary. But if you're a Kshatriya and you're empowered with that task, you can do it. <coughs> ultimately, ultimately, I don't know in Kali Yuga, I mean, they said there will be a 10,000 year of golden age in Mahaprabhu and after that there'll be hell. So I don't know whether that means that actually all the, the, all the countries will become Krishna conscious, all the leaders will become Krishna conscious, will have Krishna conscious armies. We don't know that. But it's a possibility. By knowing the science of Krishna, one can become the most perfect man in the world. And unless one has knowledge in this science, all qualifications and doctorate diplomas acquired by academic education are spoiled and useless. Maharaj Yudhishthira knew the science very well, for it is stated here that by continuous cultivation of the science or by continuous devotion to Lord Krishna, he acquired the qualification of administering the state. A father is sometimes cruel to the son, but that does not mean the father has lost the qualification to be a father. A father is always a father because he has always the good of the son at heart. The father wants every one of his sons to become a better man than himself. Therefore, a king like Maharaj Yudhishthir, who was the personality of goodness, wanted everyone under his administration, especially human beings who have better developed consciousness to become devotees of Lord Krishna, so that they can become free from the trifles of material existence. His motto of administration was all good for the citizens, for as personified goodness, he knew perfectly well what is good for them. He conducted the administration on that principle and not on the rakshas and demonic principles of sense gratification. Government is poor, let's have more lottery, more casinos. It's demonia. Let's kill more animals. Let's have more restaurants. Demonia. Let's encourage drilling and tobacco. And, and, I mean, this is all, all nonsense. Every activity will create more misery for people. What is this intelligence? With the only thing they can, they can figure out is one president comes, he stops drilling of the oil, another one comes, we need to drill more oil. One says we don't need to screw up Alaska, another one says we need to screw up Alaska. One says we don't need to screw up ocean, another one says we need to. That's all their intelligence is. And they go on to this excessive campaigning and lobbying for just this. This is what they think is good for people. And such politicians are, are considered heroes of the society. It's pathetic and shameful. As an ideal king, he had no personal ambition and there was no place for sense gratification because his senses were engaged in the loving service of the Lord, which includes the partial service to the human beings. Look at this line. Look at this purpose so profound. Service to God includes partial service to the living beings who form the parts and parcels of the complete whole. Those who are busy rendering service to the part and parcel, leaving aside the whole, only spoil time and energy as one does when watering the leaves of a tree without watering the root. If water is poured on the root, the leaves are enlivened perfectly and automatically. But if water is poured on the leaves only, the whole energy is spoiled. Maharaj Yudhishthira, therefore, was constantly engaged in the service of the Lord. And thus the part and parcels of the Lord, the living beings under its careful administration, were perfectly attended with all the comforts in the life and all progress in the next. That is the way of perfect management of state administration. So Prabhupada emphasizes knowing the science of Krishna, understanding that service to Krishna includes, chanting Hare Krishna includes service to all living entities. Shraddha Shabda Vishwas Kurile Sudhar Nishchaya Krishna Bhakta Karile Sarva Karma Krita. Sarva Karma Krita. You have served every living entity. Bhokta Ram Ekatapasam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram Suhridam Sarva Bhutanam Gyatva Maam Shantam Knowing this one attains peace. News even reached the celestial planets about Maharaj Yudhishthira's worldly possession, the sacrifices by which he would obtain a better destination. Sacrifice. In third chapter and the fifth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains one thing, one principle. Karma is meant for yajna. One principle. Karma is meant for yajna. Karma activity should be done as a sacrifice. Yajna. What is the sacrifice inherent in this particular role? What is the sacrifice inherent in my particular position? Karma is not meant for bhoga. Karma is meant for yajna. Let me perform tapasya, austerity. Let me do yajna. Let me serve, let me sacrifice, starting with the hearing and chanting of the holy name. Sankirtan yajna. 
karma is meant for yagya so we have we have karma we have good karma then then facilitate sankirtan yagya if you have energy if you have money if you have resources if you have intelligence facilitate that karma to perform yagya use your karma to perform yagya or you can't do it fully do it partially do something do something to facilitate sankirtan yagya that's what karma is meant for that's the whole summary of the first six chapters of gita if one can understand that karma is meant for yagya one got the first six chapters of bhagavad gita nothing else need to be done without sacrifice o oh arjuna how can one be happy either in this life or in the next and if one performs yagya one performs sankirtan yagya or serves to the cause of sankirtan yagya he'll become happy his good fortune will awaken he may have to do his prescribed duty the sacrifice by which he would attain a better destination his queen the stalwart brothers his extensive land his sovereignty over the planet earth and his fame purport only a rich and great man's name and fame are known all over the world and the name and fame of maharaj yudhishthir to reach the higher planets because of his good administration possessions wife the strength of his brothers and his solid sovereign power over the world known as jambudvipa here the word loka is significant there are different lokas or higher planets scattered all over the sky both material and spiritual a person can reach them by dint of his work in the present life is stated in bhagavad gita no forceful entrance is allowed there the tiny material scientists and engineers who have discovered vehicles to travel a few thousand miles in outer space will not be allowed entrance that is not the way to reach the better planets one must qualify himself by sacrifice and yet those who are sinful in every step of life can expect only to be degraded into animal life to suffer more and more the pangs of material existence and this is also stated in bhagavad gita maharaj yudhishthir's good sacrifice and qualifications were so lofty and virtuous that even the residents of the higher celestial planets were prepared to receive him as one of them and finally text 6 kim te kama sura spriha मुकुंदा मुकुंदा मनसोधुजा मनसोधुजा मुदमरजराजा शुद्धिदस्थेतरे शुद्धिदस्थेतरे किम ते कामासुरा स्प्रीहा मुकुंदा मनसोधुजा ंग Look at this. When one is materially engrossed, he is satisfied by sense gratification. But when one is liberated from the conditions of material mode, he is satisfied only by rendering loving service for the satisfaction of the Lord. This means that the living being is constitutionally a servitor, and not one who is served. Being illusioned by the condition of external energy, one falsely thinks himself to be the servant, but actually he is not served. He is the servant of the senses like lust, desire, anger, avarice, pride, madness, and intolerance. when one has in his proper senses by attainment of spiritual knowledge he realizes he is not the master but is only a servant of the senses at that time he begs for the service of the lord and becomes happy without being illusioned by so called material happiness so when one materially is engrossed one strives for sense gratification when one is liberated one actually seeks to serve krishna he realizes that he is not a master he is simply a servant of his uncontrolled mind and senses which is called so called enjoyment service to the so called mind and senses at that time he begs for the service of the lord he begs for the service of the lord that is liberation maharaj yudhishthir was one of the liberated soul and there was for him there was no pleasure in kingdom wife brothers subjects and prosperous world 
these blessings follow automatically for a pure devotee, even though the devotee doesn't aspire for them. The example set here is exactly suitable. It is said that one who is hungry is never satisfied by anything other than food. The whole material world is full of hungry living beings. The hunger is not for food, shelter, or sense gratification. The hunger is for the spiritual atmosphere. For Due to ignorance only, they think that the world is dissatisfied because there is no sufficient food, shelter, defense, and object for sense gratification. This is completely opposite to what the material world believes. This is called illusion. When the living being is hungry for spiritual satisfaction, he is misrepresented by material hunger. But the foolish leaders cannot see that even the people who are most sumptuously materially satisfied are still hungry. America has the highest number of suicides. People have everything in the world and they are so miserable, so miserable. And what is their hunger and poverty? The hunger is for spiritual food, spiritual shelter, spiritual defense, and spiritual sense gratification. That's the real hunger. These can be obtained in the association of the Supreme Spirit, Sri Krishna, and therefore one who has them cannot be attracted by the so-called food, shelter, defense, and sense gratification of the material world, even if they are relished by the denizens of heavenly planets. Therefore, in the Bhagavad Gita, it is said by the Lord that even in the topmost planet of the universe, namely the Brahma Loka, where the duration of life is multiplied by millions of years by earth calculation, one cannot satisfy his hunger. Such hunger can be satisfied only when the living being is situated in immo immortality, which is attained in the spiritual sky far, far above the Brahma Loka in the association of Lord Mukunda, the Lord who awards his devotees the transcendental pleasure of liberation. So even in Brahma Loka, we will not be satisfied. We will not be satisfied by anything. Nothing material would satisfy us. Then why are we so distracted? Why do we take to distraction and we become happy in that? Hari, what do you think? Distracted. Because um, even though we do this, when we are practicing, it's easy to, as you're saying, you know, uh, get the rahab around us, but we don't think they're happening to us. But we still have that understanding that we can still try to enjoy. We can have the best of both worlds. Best of both worlds. Yeah. But actually, the more we try, the more the more lessons. Alex, why do you think we get distracted? One thing is that we um, do the long rope to people for their Krishna development that we start conditioning. You know, in going on for days and days and days and days and days and then in a few days, you know, we can not. The fan is moving, in, you know, even if you unplug, it continues right. for a while. But in the process of chanting, we already have begun. Mm -hmm. It's going to stop. That some point. Phase. That phase should be there in some, some time. Yeah, one cannot expect immediate results. Chanakya Pandit Prabhu, any thoughts? Short time can be a long time. Guru Dalgo, why do we get distracted? We think we are enjoying. We think we are enjoying. We are master. We are controllers. But we are simply a servant of our uncontrolled mind and senses. Okay. So many important points, and Prabhupada here really puts it away. You know. It's only in material consciousness one one is an illusion, the thinking I'm enjoying. In spiritual consciousness, one is one is actually having spiritual hunger, spiritual food, spiritual defense, spiritual shelter. We want these things. Spiritual shelter of Krishna, shelter of Guru. What is spiritual food? Chanting of the holy name. Spiritual defense. What is spiritual defense? Protection of Krishna. Krishna's life insurance policy. <laughs> That's spiritual defense. Spiritual defense. Spiritual food, chanting of the holy name. Spiritual shelter, shelter of Guru and Vaishnavas and Krishna. And spiritual sense gratification. Kirtan, prasad, book, temple, 
dham, Pratyatra, festivals, seva, devotees, having fun. That's a spiritual sense, Kari. Spiritual defense means Krishna is there. Rakshitati Vishwato, Gopartve Varanam Tata, Atma Nikshepa Karpanya, Sharvidi Sharnagi. Hmm? So, devotees, I'll stop here. Any other things, any other questions for me? Anything else? My understanding is that they have been covered over because of our lack of qualification. So could you explain the extent of Jambu Dvipa for people who don't know? So what we understand is that Bhumandal, what we call as earth in Bhagavatam, Bhumandal, is composed of, uh, so you have this um, um, so you have basically what we understand that Bhumandal is comprised of seven oceans. What we call as the earth, the Bhuloka, is actually Jambudvipa. What it means is it is comprised of seven oceans and seven tracts of land. And the dimension of these are in billions of miles. Now let's take a look at the innermost island, which is called the Jambudvipa. So there are seven islands. And correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't done the cosmology for a while. So seven islands with seven concentric oceans, and that's the extent of the Bhumandal, and then you have Loka Loka mountain, and then you have darkness, and that's pretty much the extent of the universe. So in that seven islands, the innermost island is called the Jambudvipa. And now Jambudvipa, that island, is then divided into nine portions by, by, by mountain ranges. And um, the, the, the lower most, so th then if you take a circle and you divide it into nine parts, the lower most part, if you divide that further into nine parts, then the, the lower most part is called the earth, what we call as earth. And then the mountains, ranges have a different name. All those nine portions within the Jambudweep have different names. And we are in, we are in Jambudvipa. You know, I, I when I was a little child, the priest would come. He would always say Jambudvipa. When they do the, then they do the, yeah, when they do yagya, they give you a location of where you are. So when I got married, you know, the priest said in Jambudvipa, in there, in Santa Barbara, in Carpentaria, in in this address, you were there. So I remember this Jambudvipa. I said, what, this, what is this Jamundvipa they talk about? So Jambudvipa is basically, so what we understand is Bhumandal. So we understand there are 14 planetary systems. The planetary system on which we are is called the Bhumandal. It's a disk. It's a flat disk. And that disk, you can think of it as a floppy disk, a CD drive. It has nine oceans and nine tracts of land, each like billions of miles. Those nine oceans are made of milk, honey, yogurt, liquor. I mean, imagine the ocean of liquor. My God, that'd be a good place to go. <laughs> <laughs> like we have an ocean of salt water and we get so happy about it. It's, it's amazing. Ocean of yogurt, you know, ghee, ghee, nectar, nectar, no? mango shake, ocean of mango shake. Wow. I hope it's not salty. So you have these oceans which are described with billions of miles. And the innermost tract of land, the innermost island is called Jambudvipa. And it is divided into nine parts. And... Uh, in that Jambudvipa, there are abodes of gods and this and that, and you know, Lord Shiva has eleven abodes in this universe, so he has an abode in Jambudvipa too. And then we, and then the lower, most southernmost tip of that nine parts, it is further divided into nine parts. Earth is the most peripheral, the smallest that nine part. That's Bhumandala. Yeah. That's one. Yeah, yeah, the one we see as Earth. And as far as I know, 
we have no access to that. So even with the best of, 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 of uh, you know, radios and, and intercepting devices, they can't even hear any sound vibration. But we do see UFOs here and there. And I mean, F, I mean FBI spends billions of dollars in researching UFOs because they're seeing them. They're seeing objects, which they don't know what they are. Is it our duty to take control of our mind? Of course. So, I mean, the question would be, whose else duty would be to control our mind? No, I'm just asking Naeem. Can you ask him? I mean, is it? So, Naeem Prabhu, uh, help, us, help me understand the context of the question. Is that the meaning of the question? Well, there are both things are required. Both things are required. So, Alec, you know, yes, that is true that Krishna's mercy and Guru's mercy will help our mind. And ultimately, mind can be purified by service to Krishna, not by any material mental thing. And it is true that if we engage our mind, you know, but let's say even if I engage my mind, there will be times when I am just with my mind. And if I give in to the mind, and if I don't say no to the mind, you know, sometimes by force I will have to do until the mind naturally becomes purified. I can tell you, I've been practicing bhakti for 20, 21 years in this lifetime. My mind is very much attracted to matter. The natural thing for my mind is to be attracted to matter. I won't say natural, you know, a lot of it is material attraction material defense, material sense gratification, material pleasure, sleep, you know, sex life, food, defense, money, all of these things mind is naturally attracted to. Mind doesn't have faith in Krishna. So, yeah, so what do I need to do is I need to beat my mind, you know, to, to, with the shoes and broomstick every day. Sometimes the mind becomes so disturbed about so, so, so many things. So is it my duty to control the mind? Of course it's my duty. But if the question is that, can I just engage my mind in Krishna's service and Krishna will purify, that's, I think, it was the very right idea. If I engage my mind in seva, then that's good, you know. So that's why we, we keep giving ourselves controllable engagement. But we also have to be mindful. We have to know that, you know, there's a lower modes of nature and I may have to say no. And the mind is at its worst when we are alone at night, right? early in the morning, late at night, middle of the night, that's where the mind my mind attacks. He strikes, bam. Okay, all day you enjoyed the festival with devotees, you were with devote deities, you had some seva, you were able to kind of keep me away, now you come home, we'll see. We'll meet you when you are actually going to go to sleep, or we'll meet you in the dreams, or we'll meet, meet you when you first get up in the morning. That's when the mind really attacks. Power, with full force. From 6 in the morning till 9.30 p.m. you are in the temple. You are doing devotional service. Let me come back to you. I got some time too. Right? Making sense? Everybody has experience of that. Is it 10%? 110%. 110%. That's when the mind acts. You do, I go to Govardhan, I'll tell you, I go to Govardhan for a whole month, somehow with the association of devotees and go in Giriraj, I do suffer from my mind a little bit, a little bit of sense gratification for nice prasadam, you know, not a whole lot. I, I get up like every day at three in the morning, every day it's, it's beautiful devotional service and not time, that much time for Maya because there is no time for Maya. And in Giri, Govardhan in that ashram, there is not that much Maya anyways. It's a men's ashram, it's, it's with devotees, and I'm doing parikrama every day. Except for a little desire to enjoy Giriraj Mishthan Bhandar, oh. there is not a whole lot of sense gratification. I'm telling you, I spend a week, month, six weeks in Govardhan, right after that, my attacks. 
right after that, Maya attacks. And I have seen devotees who have spent time in Dham for a while, and then they go to the material world and they fall down. They have this intense purification experience, and then they just, Maya just attacks. Maya crushes them. Right, Chanakya Pandit Prabhu, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So people go to Dham, they may spend six months, one year, two years, three years, five years, and then they actually go away from devotional service. I have seen that. And also in the Dham, if you commit too many offenses, uh, Dham kicks you out. Dham kicks you out. Either you become a debauchee and you become an animal in the next birth, which is also not too bad because they say, <laughs> because they say, you know, you become, after that you go back to Godhead. So you take the birth as a hog and a dog and then you go back to Godhead. Shastra is a very, very, I would read, research this. So, you know, I go to Gaurdha and I'm like, you know, what if I'm desiring sense gratification, you know, Giriraj Mishthan Bhandar, you know, what will happen, you know? Then I think I'll become a fly or an ant or a, or a, or a, some kida in some, in Giriraj Mishthan Bhandar's Mali, you know. But then they say you'll go back to Gadad after that. I said, wow, it's not too bad. <laughs> Prasad, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to be a dog in India. You don't want to be a dog in India. You don't want to be a dog in Bengal. It's so hot that the flies will definitely eat you up. The worst thing to do is to become a dog in Mayapur. <laughs> It's like, it's like the entire purification of, like, imagine that state of existence Gurudev is describing. They won't even give you any food. You know, if some Vaishnavas are merciful, you're going to get some remnants, but that's all you're going to get. Prabhu, you were uh, mentioning, uh, you kind of related uh, the text read, um, it's very uh, interesting that when you were talking about Prabhupada, you were talking about the spiritual spot of having uh, that some people expect when you have a spirit, when you know the guru is telling you something, you get a spot, right? And I just read this study, but it's just funny that you mentioned it. That um, there's a correlation of baptisms in, in the Baptist church, and there's a correlation that a, uh, that a good percentage of them actually turn to atheists after that because they expect a lot from that significant event. And you were mentioning about Govardhan also. You know, people go there have this really intense experience, spiritual experience almost, and then they come back and then they just fall down. So, I was just thinking about the spiritual spark is that don't we want, you know, like some like taste, you know, like that lasting taste or lasting, you know, like, I know that I have to be a pradihata yayatma that we shouldn't want anything, but isn't the desire to like have that spiritual experience with Krishna? So, I see that dichotomy of, you know, we don't, we just shouldn't expect it, that you said we should only want submissive hearing. That's what our, our goal is. And then the, the person, uh, the guru chants, and we hear properly, and that is the spiritual experience. But shouldn't we want, you know, that more intense relationship with Krishna, where he is, um, he is reciprocating accordingly, and sometimes um, we, uh, we don't feel that reciprocation, we actually get hurt, you know, that I'm standing for so many years and nothing's really happening. So then we may start losing faith. You know, that our mind is so fit, our heart is not being cleansed, or I'm not getting attachment to process, even though I had it one time and I'm not having it anymore. So, sure, I, 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 could you expand on that? I'll share my thoughts and I'd like to hear Chanakya Pandit Prabhu's thoughts also. Two questions, Hari. There are two different questions you asked. One is should we seek a peak experience in bhakti, going to the dham? going to Yatras. Should we seek peak experiences in Bhakti? We should seek, what we should seek is, is an opportunity for Sadhu Sangha, Dham Sangha. We should not necessarily seek out peaks or valleys. That's the dangerous position. 
we should seek out sadhu sangha we should seek out dhamma sangha we should seek out opportunities where we feel our bhakti is facilitated but sometimes like for example you know even if i go to a dham i'll give you an example i go to i went to govardhan and one of the sanyasis fell down and really hurt himself really bad and basically i spent one week in a polo hospital in delhi with him now it's very interesting you know the environment of the hospital is the environment of the hospital is no different from environment here i work in a hospital so i am in govardhan i am in govardhan and what ended up happening was i ended up with that sanyasi for a week and the sanyasi was sick you know of course i was happy to be in his association but you know most of my time in the day when are the nurses coming when are the doctors coming when is the test being done what are the results of the test and in india things are not so professional either even in big hospitals you have to really chase it down and because i know too much sometimes when you know too much you know that's also a problem you know so i know too much so i'm like you know when is this going to be done when is that going to be done when is this test going to be done how are the meals going to be arranged he can't eat hospital food so coordinating with devotees who are bringing prasadam in delhi you know to now again devotees are bringing prasadam you know kesha bharti maharaj called that you know so and so sanyasi is in a hospital he needs prasadam you know so it was it was it was not the best experience but it's an experience hari which will stay with me for the rest of my life you know sometimes you go to a yatra and you get sick and you end up two or three days in the bed you know so what i'm saying is that one should not seek peaks or that's not the goal of being you know the goal of being is is bhakti and i would ex- i would i would i would accept and be open to krishna's mercy in whatever way shape or form it comes in whatever way shape or form it comes you know so that should be our consciousness in whatever way shape or form krishna's mercy come i'll be open to it i will definitely make my efforts we all plan to go to wonderful festivals wonderful sangha but in whatever way shape or form it comes it's good you know and and i will look for more deeper experiences and i would pray for steadiness in my life that that should be one's mood you know instead of for swing peaks or valleys or getting too depressed or too agitated you know you know i'm not going to be bipolar i'm going to be i'm going to maintain equanimity in my life and i would i would seek deeper realizations one time i was in govardhan there was this full govardhan prasadam and we were all in prasadam consciousness for a few days because they make so many preparations and the planning and ashram was cooking and they asked me to sponsor i said fine you know a thousand dollars in india get can feed you know just you know 1 dollar feeds um, uh, about five people you know so we fed 5000 people prashad nice prashad huh? for 1000 dollars you know so that included the dakshina to the cook and everything you know so you know we were in prashadam consciousness and after the govardhan puja was over one pilgrim came one pilgrim came and uh, they had they had put all the leftover prashadam in there and they closed the door and they said you know it's about 5 pm started prasadam at 9 in the morning it's 5 pm you know but that pilgrim some found a little prasadam on the floor he took it he put it in his mouth he just prayed to krishna like that and he went away you know i was thinking that experience i had i understood the sanctity of prasadam by that one experience you know so many times hari in the in the association of senior devotees or in dhama krishna's mercy comes in many ways sometimes our own anarthas become exaggerated and you have to really understand how far. so in many many ways mercy comes one should look for krishna's mercy and whatever krishna brings in our life okay that's one question the second question is if we don't get if we don't get peak experiences or if we don't get the taste we will lose faith in the holy name so my my impression is this hari you know we, no, actually you don't lose faith in the holy name by that you know you uh, you don't lose faith in the holy name 
even by going through some very you know mundane periods in your devotional life. Um, you only lose faith. You actually become very strong, actually, in your devotional life, in your devotional faith, by going through some very mundane periods in your devotional life. That is a fact, Hari. Um, you know, Chanakya Prabhu, would you like to say something to this point? You know, what will be detrimental to your spiritual life? Is it is it is it peak experiences? Is it um, some mercy from Krishna, or how does this dynamic would work? As much as possible, <clears throat> we should not try to think of getting some experience. The first thing, don't have expectations. The first thing, because expectations are material things. If you have expectations, and, and you cannot measure, measure the rate of expectations, the magnitude of expectations, you're suddenly going to be frustrated. So first thing, give up expectations of anything. And then the second is that <clears throat> this Christian consciousness we should not be, that's why the scripture said we should not just be eager, in most cases, to go to holy places, to associate with even great devotees and all that, all that stuff. Because it requires some build up of consciousness to be able to have proper association because this process is very, very uh, powerful. We come closer, so close to it. If you don't have proper attitude, you're going to get hot, both in the dam and association of great devotees and all that. So one should prepare the consciousness for going to the dam, prepare the consciousness for associating with great devotees and all that, even though to commit offenses, and then you get good, get hot. The little credit you have, we lost. This is so. First of all, is that we should not just expect to begin to have some experiences in the power of devotional service. We should concentrate in trying to be uh, to 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 be introspective, to cleanse ourselves, our consciousness, cleanse our motives in the power of devotional service, and then engage in the proper sadhana or devotional service. As much as the purification is getting on, you be getting the experiences on 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 sought for. The experience is becoming, you'll be getting more and more realization, more and more. The more you're getting deeper, the more you are realizing what the process is, the more you're getting faith. So that is how it works. There are no magic about that. It's just a matter of you follow the process because if you have enough sukriti, you'll be faithful on the process being, being given. The process you're following, you'll be very, very faithful to it, knowing that, yes, even though I'm not getting these experiences, it will come. But you should work on yourself. You know, there are so many things to work on oneself. There are so many things. So, but by associating consciously and uh, mindfully with the process of devotional service, then suddenly the cleansing will take place and then experiences will suddenly come. It will come. And then the more you get in that experience, the more your faith increases. The more you're getting some taste you know, in the part of devotional service. So we should not. The first thing is offenses. Offenses. It comes in so many ways, you know. And these offenses, in most cases, it starts with inattentiveness, doing things anyhow, not being mindful of the process, not valuing the process that we have, the process of devotional service. It's when we uh, value the process of devotional service. You know, we beg for it. You we'll seriously beg for the process of devotional service. You know, in most cases we don't really value the process of devotional service. We don't really know the value. What talk of valuing it? You see, so the more we understand and uh, you know we value the process of devotional service itself, then the more we become more attentive in every aspect of it. I see, and then offenses will be reduced. Lots of offenses in most cases, 
a part of the devotional section. Different ways, subtle offenses, you know, physical offenses and all that. But uh, ultimately, we, we should have a mind of dependence on Krishna's and Guru's mercy. You know, we should always beg for their mercy, always pray for their mercy. In that sense, the, the Lord Krishna will illuminate our, our conscience, illuminate our heart, to be able to know exactly what to do at a particular point in time. We may lose hope or faith, or whatever. But very nice point. Kind of like, uh, like I, I know, be Rati by 2025, <laughs> Rati by 2025, Prema by 2027. Yeah. Like it just, I guess, it's a continuous in the journey. Right? Yeah. Just like, and sometimes we are just timing ourselves for that one faith, or one realization. Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, even in one lifetime, you can get rid of one anartha. That's actually pretty good. Um, and he made a good point. We lose faith when we commit offenses to the devotees, when we take things for granted. So, Hari, you know, Krishna may not overtly reciprocate our words, but that does not, in itself, my experience has been due to lack of faith. But when we just kind of just, you know, not prime ourselves, when we don't see the value, when we take things cheaply, take things deeply, commit offenses in that way, you know, major offenses, then, then we lose. And he made a good point that one of the reasons devotees may have a bad experience after the Bhagavan is because they do commit a lot of offenses in the Bhagavan. And the, so whatever meager security they have, they have sort of false along. One, th one thing I know is that Raghunath Swami do not take people who have not been chanting for a certain time to the Bhagavan. And I used to think, why not? You know, take everybody. Everybody should get the association of the Bhagavan. But I'm, I'm learning more and more myself. People are sometimes when they're not qualified, they only be kind of offense. Aparad. And it can be major sometimes, you know, and it's not good for their bhakti like a tree called. Offenses in the sense in the palm are just uh, basically but offenses in the palm can be like gratifying the senses or is it like for breaking the four regs or is it like like offenses to Vaishnavas in the palm? All of them. So okay. all of them, Namapara, Dhamapara, Sevapara, mm -hmm. offenses to Dham, offenses to Dham Bhakti, you know, how you see the Dham, mm -hmm. you know, people excessively complain about their situation. Um, how can I do it? How can I do it? How can I do it? It's offenses to devotees. All of, all, everybody is Dham Bhakti. They have, they have more scrupulity than anybody else. Offenses to the name, sense gratification, breaking regulatory principles, all of that. You know, you know Prabhupada did warn devotees not to chant in Bhavan for too long. Mm -hmm. So, and then I asked Asad Krishna Maharaj sometime, Maharaj, who can sing Govardhan? And Maharaj says that you have to be at least 60% pure, he said, to live in Govardhan. He said he's, been, he's lived his life in Govardhan, right? But as a teenager, he came there and he lived his entire life. He said, Sambalata has seen many, many people. He said, even sannyasi, they come for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. Everybody comes, but comes for a certain period of time. And then they go back. They go back to their preaching series. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, like you know, sometimes a new devotee comes to the temple and you know, <laughs> Also, sometimes we think whoever we accepted the devotee prayer devotee, right? We don't expect like this step. He is very grateful that he is something is good and so I cannot I cannot accept that this devotee is something good. Then the devotee. We don't know we don't know who are we. The, the demigods cannot recognize the devotee. Who are we? That's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a devotee may have an idea or a conception this is how an advanced devotee or guru should behave, and if he doesn't fall in that box, you know, then he may he may feel that he's taking a little bit. So you're saying in the material world that don't meet your heroes, because if you meet your heroes, they're not going to be like how you expect them to be. So maybe it's because he has a perception that they're going to be like this, mm -hmm. no, no nothing, and, and, and it should basically be like that, but then it just how it really is. Sometimes different from the truth. Thank you. 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 Thank you